time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Tonight's testimony and evidence is as sobering as it is straightforward. Within minutes of stepping off the ellipse stage, Donald Trump knew about the violent attack on the Capitol. From the comfort of his dining room, he watched on TV as the attack escalated. <clears throat> he sent tweets that inflamed and expressed support for the desire of some to literally kill Vice President Mike Pence. For three hours, he refused to call off the attack. <clears throat> Donald Trump refused to take the urgent advice he received that day. Not from his political opponents or from the liberal media, but from his own family, his own friends, his own staff, and his own advisors. In the midst of an attack, when there was no time for politics, the people closest to Trump told him the truth. It was his supporters attacking the Capitol, and he alone could get through to them. So they pled for him to act, to place his country above himself. Still, he refused to lead and to meet the moment to honor his oath. It was only once the vice president and the members of Congress were in secure locations and the officers defending the Capitol began to turn the tide that then President Trump engaged in the political theater of telling the mob to go home. And even then, he told them all they were special and that he loved them. <clears throat> whatever your politics, whatever you think about the outcome of the election, we as Americans must all agree on this. Donald Trump's conduct on January 6th was a supreme violation of his oath of office and a complete dereliction of his duty to our nation. It is a stain on our history. It is a dishonor to all those who have sacrificed and died in service of our democracy. When we present our full findings, we will recommend changes to laws and policies to guard against another January 6th. The reason that's imperative is that the forces Donald Trump ignited that day have not gone away. The militant, intolerant ideologies, the militias, the alienation and the disaffection, the weird fantasies and disinformation, they're all still out there, ready to go. That's the elephant in the room. But if January 6th has reminded us of anything, I pray it has reminded us of this. Laws are just words on paper. They mean nothing without public servants dedicated to the rule of law and who are held accountable by a public that believes oath matters, oaths matter more than party tribalism or the cheap thrill of scoring political points. We the people must demand more of our politicians and ourselves. Oaths matter. Character matters. Truth matters. If we do not renew our faith and commitment to these principles, this great experiment of ours, our shining beacon on a hill, will not endure. I yield to the gentlewoman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Kensinger. Throughout our hearings, we've provided many facts and painted a vivid picture of the events of January 6th. The violence, the human toll, both emotional and physical, including the tragic loss of life. The threats to our Constitution, the rule of law, and the danger to this nation a nation we all love as Americans. In tonight's hearing, we've gone into great detail about the events inside the White House on January 6th. 
We've described how the President of the United States, who was bound by oath to the Constitution and by duty to ensure the laws are faithfully executed, took no action when the cornerstone of our democracy, a peaceful transition of power, was under attack. But it's more than that. Donald Trump summoned a violent mob and promised to lead that mob to the Capitol to compel those he thought would cave to that kind of pressure. And when he was thwarted in his effort to lead the armed uprising, he instigated the attackers to target the vice president with violence, a man who just wanted to do his constitutional duty. So in the end, this is not as it may appear, a story of inaction in a time of crisis. But instead, it was the final action of Donald Trump's own plan to assert the will of the American people and remain in power. Not until it was clear that his effort to violently disrupt or delay the counting of the election results had failed did he send his message, a message to his supporters in which he commiserated with their pain and he told them affectionately to go home. That was not the message of condemnation and just punishment for those who broke the law that we expect from a president whose oath and duty is to ensure the laws are faithfully executed. But instead, it was his newest version of stand back and stand by. To me, this is personal. I first swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution against enemies foreign and domestic when I entered the US Naval Academy at age 17. I spent two decades on ships at sea, defending our nation from known and identifiable foreign enemies who sought to do us harm. I never imagined that that enemy would come from within. I was not as prescient as Abraham Lincoln, who 23 years before the Civil War said, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and its finisher. Donald Trump was the author, and we the people, for ourselves and our posterity, should not let Donald Trump be the finisher. Thank you, and I yield to the Vice Chair. We owe a debt to all of those who have and will appear here. And that brings me to another point. This committee has shown you the testimony of dozens of Republican witnesses, those who served President Trump loyally for years. The case against Donald Trump in these hearings is not made by witnesses who were his political enemies. It is instead a series of confessions by Donald Trump's own appointees, his own friends, his own campaign officials, people who worked for him for years, and his own family. They have come forward and they have told the American people the truth. And for those of you who seem to think the evidence would be different if Republican leader McCarthy had not withdrawn his nominees from this committee, let me ask you this. Do you really think Bill Barr is such a delicate flower that he would wilt under cross-examination? Pat Cipollone, Eric Hirschman, Jeff Rosen, Richard Donahue, of course they aren't. None of our witnesses are. At one point in 2016, when he was first running for office, Donald Trump said this, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and I wouldn't lose any voters. That quote came to mind last week when audio from Trump advisor Steve Bannon surfaced from October 31st, 2020, just a few days before the presidential election. Let's listen. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory, right? He's going to declare victory. It, but it, that doesn't mean he's the winner. He's just going to say he's the winner. The Democrats, more of our people vote early that count. Theirs vote in May. And so they're going to have a natural disadvantage and Trump's going to take advantage of it. That's our strategy. He's going to declare himself a winner. So when you wake up Wednesday morning, it's going to be a firestorm. Also, also if, Trump is, if Trump is losing by 10 or 11 o'clock at night, it's going to be even crazier. Cause he, no, because he's going to sit right there and say they stole. 
And of course, four days later, President Trump declared victory when his own campaign advisors told him he had absolutely no basis to do so. What the new Steve Bannon audio demonstrates is that Donald Trump's plan to falsely claim victory in 2020, no matter what the facts actually were, was premeditated. Perhaps worse, Donald Trump believed he could convince his voters to buy it, whether he had any actual evidence of fraud or not. And this same thing continued to occur from Election Day onward until January 6th. Donald Trump was confident that he could convince his supporters the election was stolen, no matter how many lawsuits he lost, and he lost scores of them. He was told over and over again, in immense detail, that the election was not stolen. There was no evidence of widespread fraud. It didn't matter. Donald Trump was confident he could persuade his supporters to believe whatever he said, no matter how outlandish, and ultimately, that they could be summoned to Washington to help him remain president for another term. As we showed you last week, even President Trump's legal team, led by Rudy Giuliani, knew they had no actual evidence to demonstrate the election was stolen. Again, it didn't matter. Here's the worst part. Donald Trump knows that millions of Americans who supported him would stand up and defend our nation were it threatened. They would put their lives and their freedom at stake to protect her. And he is preying on their patriotism. He is preying on their sense of justice. And on January 6th, Donald Trump turned their love of country into a weapon against our capital and our Constitution. He has purposely created the false impression that America is threatened by a foreign force controlling voting machines, or that a wave of tens of millions of false ballots were secretly injected into our election system, or that ballot workers have secret thumb drives and are stealing elections with them. All complete nonsense. We must remember that we cannot abandon the truth and remain a free nation. In late November of 2020, while President Trump was still pursuing lawsuits, many of us were urging him to put any genuine evidence of fraud forward in the courts and to accept the outcome of those cases. As January 6th approached, I circulated a memo to my Republican colleagues explaining why our congressional proceedings to count electoral votes could not be used to change the outcome of the election. But what I did not know at the time was that President Trump's own advisors, also Republicans, also conservatives, including his White House counsel, his Justice Department, his campaign officials, they were all telling him almost exactly the same thing I was telling my colleagues. There was no evidence of fraud or irregularities sufficient to change the election outcome. Our courts had ruled it was over. Now we know that it didn't matter what any of us said because Donald Trump wasn't looking for the right answer legally or the right answer factually. He was looking for a way to remain in office. Let's put that aside for a moment and focus just on what we saw today. In our hearing tonight, you saw an American president faced with a stark and unmistakable choice between right and wrong. There was no ambiguity, no nuance. Donald Trump made a purposeful choice to violate his oath of office, to ignore the ongoing violence against law enforcement, to threaten our constitutional order. There is no way to excuse that behavior. It was indefensible. And every American must consider this. Can a president who is willing to make the choices Donald Trump made during the violence of January 6th ever be trusted with any position of authority in our great nation again. In this room, in 1918, the Committee on Women's Suffrage convened to discuss and debate whether women should be granted the right to vote. This room is full of history, and we on this committee know we have a solemn obligation not to idly squander what so many Americans have fought and died for. 
Ronald Reagan's great ally, Margaret Thatcher, said this, let it never be said that the dedication of those who love freedom is less than the determination of those who would destroy it. Let me assure every one of you this, our committee understands the gravity of this moment, the consequences for our nation. We have much work yet to do, and we will see you all in September. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I see. So that was that was an interesting hearing. <laughs> I guess that's the, the easiest way to put that. Uh, in listening to a lot of the comments, a lot of the uh, the, the stories coming out, I'm um, I keep coming back to this uh, thing that uh, that that was that was just said a little bit ago during the hearing that that. That, that grabbed my uh, my attention. Um, you know, Trump told the rioters that they were special on one hand, and Liz Cheney made the defense that yeah, they were they were special, they were patriotic, and you know, good God fearing Americans. And Trump took advantage of that, and and I, I'm I'm going to struggle with that. I think I'm going to struggle with that argument. I, I really, I think I am. But here to share some thoughts on well, where we are with this. Well, with the response, I've asked our good friend Sarah Burris to come share some thoughts. She's a reporter over at Raw Story. Sarah, thanks for taking time for us. Hello, how are you? Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm processing processing all of the information. Lots of it. Uh, I'm, I think I'm 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 hung up on the ending a little bit. The ending, the justification. I'm I'm struggling with just a little bit. This idea that those people that that were in the Capitol, the people who were who were smashing the windows, who were urinating on desks, and yes, defecating on the floor, um, you know, I'm sorry, I, that's not patriotic. No, I'm I'm struggling with that. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's something that um, I wonder if that's a piece of this because they kind of have to um, they have to move this out of. Like, this is a, a, a bigger issue than just the insurrectionists on January 6th. And they're trying to make the tie um, that Donald Trump basically manipulated people, that he's been manipulating people since the very beginning. And um, I, I think that that is a cop-out for a lot of militia members and Tea Party members and, you know, folks that have been doing this kind of white right-wing nuttery for a long time so the idea that they are somehow these these um uh these soft-hearted patriots who otherwise would be cuddling with with cops outside of the capital i think is a little far-fetched but I, I get what she's trying to do. I no, get no, she's, she's trying to save the Republican to, Party is what she's trying to do. <laughs> well, I think there's that, but I think she's trying to make it seem like this is um, all, it, draw, draw all of the conclusions that Trump is the is the catalyst. That no. none of this would have happened without Donald Trump, because that is the you know the the pillar of indictment that 
I feel like we're going for here. No, and I think that she, I think they did a, if that was the goal, if it's all about Trump, it's all about going after, uh, taking out the top of the, of the ticket there. They, I think they've done that. I think they've done that masterfully. Uh, as where I still want to see the money. I want to see the people who funded yeah. this. I want I want it all. I'm greedy that way. I think it was, <laughs> a, it, as they said, a stain on the history of this country, a stain on this country, something that has to be cleaned up. And the only way we do that is by sunshine and disinfectant and getting rid of the people who, who are behind all this. Absolutely. And... That's a big piece of what I feel like there was a good New York Times story this week that talked about the transition from the Tea Party to the MAGA movement um, and talking about the Women for America First creator, um, Amy Kramer, and how she came out of the Tea Party and then became this MAGA person. And she basically, the whole story ends with her saying, you know, I was here before Donald Trump. I'll be here after Donald Trump. We are already moving on from Donald Trump. And it's, this is, there, there is a, a radical right-wing terrorism aspect of this that we have not dealt with. Um, I think we've sort of danced around the idea about it, and we've talked about how it needs to be fully funded, that Homeland Security can go after these people, and that the FBI has more resources for this. But the reality is this is the manifestation of when you have somebody who lights the powder keg of right-wing, you know, crazy people and militias and all of this. And um, there was a, there was a poll or a uh, survey, the University of California Davis took something like 9,000 people and, um, and asked them, you know, opinions about, you know, where do you think the country is going? And um, I think it's like 50.1% said that they anticipate a civil war within the next few years. Like, I mean, I think we make jokes about that sometimes, but I mean, holy crap. No, I mean, it's, like, it's I, crazy. I, and, and there's part of me that goes, how much of that is, is that's what you want or, or, or that's what you expect yeah. or it's what we're being repeatedly told is coming because, you know, yeah, this is, this from is those nutters. right. This is where I, I come back to, you know, I know a couple people who are the, yeah, we're going to have civil war, but the majority of people I know, they just want to, to lead family lives. They want good schools and good safe neighborhoods. They want jobs. I mean, there's a lot more that pulls us together. And I look at, you know, what we see out of the F channel, what we see out of the, the right wing outrage machine. And it really is about pushing this narrative of division and ripping us apart. And I think I think that has to be dealt with. I agree. Um, I, I, one of the biggest things that happened today that I think was the most important is that um, OAN was dropped from another carrier. Uh, they were dropped from, um, was it Dish? And now they've been dropped from Verizon. Um, the more, I think, networks like that, the more, more cable companies like that say this is dangerous for us to be allowing stuff like this on our airwaves, I think the better um, but then on the, on the flip side, you're just basically driving them into their own little hole of, of organizing. And so it's like, you have this weird balance of, do we want to see it so that we can monitor it? Or do we want to isolate them further? And no, see, I'm, I'm okay with them being in their hole. Like they've been, cause we've always had these crazy groups, right? They've always been in the shadows. They've, the problem is, is we had a president that emboldened them to come out and do mass recruiting and then to find others and they go, no, it's okay. It's okay to be a white supremacist lunatic. It's okay to be a homophobe. It's okay to be, you know, yeah. check the box. No, I want you, you can in your, take hole. your hoods off now. Yeah. yeah keep, keep your, keep your hood in the, in the closet. Keep your hoods on. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I think that's one of the things that we've seen with some of the um, the nutters who've been, some of the militia people who've been marching lately that they're, they're covering their faces back up again. And it's like, oh, good, good. Just please just go ahead and put the whole hood on for us because that's, that's just really helpful to be able to identify that that's who you are. No, it's it's just crazy. It's crazy the stuff that we've seen come out of this committee. Any anything today that that you would go, you know, oh, something I didn't know. I'll, I'll tell you what I didn't know. 
I didn't know how close they got to Mike Pence. I knew they were close. I knew there was the the parking garage thing. I knew they were kind of close. They were, I guess they said, with what, like five feet? Yeah. Initially, we had heard, I think, early in, uh, after the six, we heard it was within 100 feet. And then I want to say maybe a month ago, we learned it was within 40 feet. And now we're finding out that, no, they were right there. Um, I spoke to... We had a member of Congress who talked to us tonight who said that um, she watched tapes of her and a couple of other members running into the uh, third floor elevator. And 30 seconds after they got into the elevator, that's when the crowd moved through. And she said, I had no idea that they were that close to us. And um, I think that's what a lot of members have seen throughout the course of this is just how dangerous it was. I think everybody knew and they were scared but the level of fear extended far beyond, you know, new members of Congress who've never seen anything like this before. Um, we had secret service agents who were, who were relaying messages to their family because they thought that they were going to die. Yeah. I mean, and nobody has seen secret- this before. I mean, this is, you know, you know, new members of Congress, old members of Congress, nobody ha- has, has lived through this before. Uh, and, and and nobody should have to live through this again. Look, we have disagreements. And I, I think uh, Matthew Pottinger's comments about, look, looking back to the Nixon election and the Kennedy election back in 60, looking back to the Gore-Bush election in 2000, that's the right frame. If you if you don't get the outcome you want, you go to court. If, if you don't agree with the decision, well, that's that's our system. You move on. Look, I'm I'm bitter over the 2000 election. I think this country would be completely different if we had a President Gore instead of a President Bush. But you know what? That was the rule of law and you followed it and you moved on. Um, yeah. Uh, yet we got a problem. I didn't go to the Capitol. I didn't go to the Capitol in a riot. Did you? No, in I did not. I, I, yeah. But then again, I didn't have someone who who was calling me there. Not that I would have gone, yeah. but I didn't have someone who um, who knew his power over me and, and call, summonsed me there. Because look, at the end of this, no matter what you say about the people who were there on January 6th, they were there with one mission. And that was to stop the certification of the election. I don't care what you say about why you were there. Oh, no, it was a picnic day. No, no, it was a wonderful day. It's a day of love and family and God, fear and Christian being. What a blah, 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 blah. No, you were there for one purpose under the banner of stop the steal. That's what you were there for. That's There's no other justification. Stop talking. End of sentence. Yeah, I agree. And this is, I think, what the committee has been aiming toward is that they are connecting this with you know this was this is all planned every piece and part of it was part of a conversation that trump started having um as early as the first of december and you know that was part of what all of his um crazy nutty friends um and lawyers were trying to figure out is how can we you know if this doesn't work then what's next and i think Obviously, this came up for what's next. And what we've seen over and over again is that it's no one else in the White House really had any idea of of what of, that this was going to happen, and that Trump was essentially behind it. And what's been interesting is seeing all of these people who, you know, were on the Trump train, who were Trump staffers, people who should know, like we do, that he's a complete psycho. Right. Like, I feel like years now we've known we, we saw this guy campaign through 2016. We saw what kind of person he was. We saw him bragging about saying I can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and nothing would happen to me. So these people went to work for him, but they were surprised on January 6th when he was like, well, let him hang him. <laughs> like, I, it's, it's shocking to see that they were surprised. But yeah. at the same time, you're just like, what? I wonder, I had this discussion with my friend Edry and we were just like, is this because you're, um, you're so delusional that you think that he has like a normal side to him or are you, you know, do you think that he is all for show and that none of this was real? You know, like I, it's just like, where do you, where do you get this idea that he, he honestly would have thought that 
you know, he would have seen this and thought, this is really bad. Wow. That's what a normal person thinks. And that's not who he is. That's never who he has been. No, that's the crazy part. And it's just, it's really bizarre. You're listening to the Rick Smith show here with Sarah Burris. She's a reporter over at Raw Story. Make sure you check out the work she does over at Raw Story, rawstory.com, the website. If you've missed any portion of the program, make sure you grab the podcast. Always there, always available. You can get that at the ricksmithshow.com. Also remember, follow us on social media at the ricksmithshow.com, on Twitter at Rick Smith Show. You got questions, comments, email me, Rick at the ricksmithshow.com. I do answer all emails personally. The best way to strengthen America's economy? How about investing in America's fastest growing industry? Clean energy. It means millions of jobs that pay well and can't be outsourced. And lower utility costs for families. Congress, let's get it done. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm looking at this hearing and so much to dig into, so much to grab a hold of, so much to, so much, I'm stuck on. Uh, Donald Trump is a stain on our history. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on that because it's true. What happened on January 6th is a stain on our history. Uh, I'm here to share some thoughts on the hearing. Uh, I wanted to get our good friend Bob Nay to come on, former Ohio congressman and political analyst. Bob, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you, Rick. So let's let's jump right into it. Uh, uh, thoughts on the uh, the presentation of the, the, the hearing here? Quite amazing. It's sobering. It is. Uh, it was well done. And you know, look, Rick. I'm a, a political junkie, a political addict. I was in office 24 years. I pay attention to things. You know, even now because I do radio and you know you research things. I was uh, in charge of House Administration. Zoe Lofgren's on the committee. I was, uh, you know, what she is now as chair. So I know the intricacies of the Capitol, et cetera. I talked to people in D.C. Having said all of that. This was fresh, new, precise, minute by minute, hour by hour information that is sobering. It it just blows my mind when you you look at what this hearing was involved with, was to fixate itself upon what the president was doing and his response to the situation, and then they would follow with the witnesses. And the most telling thing of this entire thing is once again – these are all Trump people. And, and look, when Pottinger started his, uh, his statement, and he was you know, with the National Security Agency, he makes it clear that Trump did some good things. Trump did this, the China you know, attitude Trump had, etc. And then they go into what he believed Trump should have done, what he was doing, and what he knew. So again, uh, it, it's actually it's painful. To, to watch it, but it's sobering truth. I thought it was well done. No, I thought it was really well done. And wow, and, wow. and again, you're know, going through that minute by minute. You know, mm-hmm. the fact that for all that time did nothing, and it wasn't until the Pentagon called. Uh, it wasn't until Mike Pence did. You know, did some stuff. It wasn't until everybody was moving in the direction to call the National Guard that they're like, uh oh, we better we better put on at least well at least uh, make it look like we tried. Uh, and that's when, when the action actually happened. Right. And then all the people urging him, it was still went back to statements by Jared Kushner. And what, it went back through, you know, everything that verifies that this is accurate. They couldn't get him to budge. When they would get him to budge somewhat, he still would not want to say certain things. The outtakes were uh, – it was amazing to watch the outtakes and his – you, know, you could tell he didn't want to say this. He didn't want to be there. He was cutting words out. Uh, and no matter what, it, and again, even though I have paid attention to the time frames in the committee, when they laid it out tonight and you see where he was, what he was not doing, which is the important part, and his, his you know fixation and isolation while all of this is going on at the Capitol, which is you know inexcusable what was done to the Capitol, and it – it focused on where he was at. This was about Donald Trump, not the Constitution, not the vice president, not the election process, not the good of the country. This was pure Trump 
still trying to take the election. Yeah. You know, he as they were storming the Capitol inside, and he knew it. He was calling senators. He was calling them, yeah. trying well, to, to to stop the election. And and I think we knew some of that already. I think some of that had already leaked you out. You have to see it. You know. Yeah. Once you once the, this is you're right. We knew it. But once you see this effectively put together, as they as this committee did, it's very powerful. No, and, and the juxtaposition of, of Trump, you know, lazy, you know, in the in the in the in the dining room, you know, watching, you know, his handiwork on Fox, doing doing virtually nothing, and then you've got everybody else working diligently into the night to actually try and make. I mean, what what time did Trump finally go off to bed? Was it like six o'clock, like six fifteen? 627 is what they said he went off to bed uh, and yet you still had you know everyone else working till you know when did they certify sometime two three o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning yeah i mean right. yeah, he's off sleeping like a baby and the, the the mess that he's created you've got people cleaning up uh again i just thought this was this was fantastic well done well, well done. done. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're with Bob Nay, former Ohio congressman and political analyst. I want to bring back in our, our good friend, Sarah Burris. Sarah's a reporter over at Raw Story. Also wanted to get some thoughts from both of you guys on this stuff. Because, you know, again, I go back to this. And, Sarah, thanks for sticking around with us. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so, you know, I go back to this. And, and I'm, I'm how is how do you think this stuff is going to play? Do you see any – let's start with you, Sarah. How do you think this is going to play tomorrow? How do you think this is going to – any reaction? Do you think this is going to move the needle in Trump world? Do you think that they're going to see see Trump saying the words that he was saying and go, oh, my God, I was the dupe? Is there that, that light bulb moment where they go, I'm the idiot here? Do you think that happens? I don't think that there are. Um, I think people who are maybe casual Trump fans, you're starting to see some of those folks flip people who were um like Ob obama voters in um in 2012 and then trump voters in 2020 you're starting to see some polling about that where um the those folks are are flipping back uh but i think a lot of that that core what like 30 percent of nutters i think we have 30 percent of nutters who are just gonna stay if it's not Donald Trump, if even even if it's not him, I think it's it's going to be somebody else, right? Like I, I feel bad for Mike Pence. He poor guy thinks that he really has a shot at being president. It's like, dude, you got thirty percent of the party who's still, <laughs> you know, up Trump's spot. There's no way. There's no way. These people tried to kill you. Do you not understand that? No. Um, but. Uh, my barometer has always sort of been my mother, and my mother told me today, she was like, God, I wish these things would be over, because watching them is is horrible, and it makes me sick every time, and it's like, oh, well, okay. Uh, I, 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 hope that's, I hope that's not the response. Bob, let's get your thoughts. Do you think this is going to move the needle much at all? Well, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Sarah said, uh, and, but I think where, where this moves the needle, and I sat today for two hours with a long time top political uh, democratic consultant and we just we've been friends a long time we went over the whole thing and and I talked about the hearing you know before obviously it was on because it was at lunch today and I was telling him I think if the hearing was as it thought I it, I thought it would come out which it did came out better uh, I, I think that what this the needle this moves is within uh, the the political spectrum of the kind of powers to be the people that move and shake on the Republican side. I think this hurts Trump. And I've said this before. I don't believe he'll run. I think he'll announce and he'll find some reason then, you know, to, to not carry it out. But I agree. Pence is, he's done. There's other people. But beyond that, I think if anything, this has hurt him with enough people, not the base that loves him if he would, you know, shot somebody on in, in Manhattan. But I think that this has hurt him with some fringe uh, uh, political people within the Republican Party. Uh, there was a Wisconsin focus group, which I love focus groups you dig in, the people that were the Obama people, and then they switch, et cetera. They're, Trump's now lost them. Uh, so I, I think some of that element has went away from me. But him, But most important, I think these hearings have effectively chilled some of the people 
that are close to the Trump orbit to to make them think that you know he he shouldn't run. Now, at the end of the day, why do I think that he won't run? He, he might announce to try to escape some problems. I don't think he'll run, and I've been saying this since January, as you know, because uh, he he doesn't want to lose again. No, he, he won't run because it's a narcissistic, pure Trump world thing. No, I also wanted to get your thoughts because, look, you know, he still hasn't conceded. He's never going to concede. In fact, right. up to just there was a story just the other day that he's still pushing in Wisconsin to have them overturn the 2020 right. election. Right. He just made a call. Right. And you go, at what point do you, do you just go, you know what? you got to give it up. It's over. You're, you, is he, you know, you know, is it going to be 10 years down the road still trying to overturn the 2020 election? Well, yes, he is. And the Republicans, look, the last thing they want is to obsess on the election. They want to hit gasoline tax, economy, crime. You know, that you, you know the mantra. That's what they want. They don't want this to be the issue in the fall. They have other issues that they want. So, yeah. But he doesn't care. Because Donald Trump doesn't care about what the Republican Party and what's best about November for them. He cares about Donald Trump, and so he'll he'll run this thing forever. This will be the forever stolen election. Yeah, and he's still raising money off of it, oddly enough, sure which, is, is. which yeah. is just bizarre. Right. Sarah, your thoughts? I mean, you know, you, you got him still out there, you know, saying, hey, let's overturn Wisconsin. I mean, he's still fixated on this, and, and it's not healthy. It's not healthy. No, it's definitely not healthy, um, and the congressman's right that The point he makes about the focus group in Wisconsin, um, that same company did a focus group the month before in Arizona where they had the exact same results. And that was before um, the Republicans from Arizona testified and before Cassidy Hutchinson testified. So I think just knowing that alone is huge in understanding where the Republican Party is right now as, um, you know, not necessarily the, the nutter base, but the people who feel so disaffected by the party and um, who are, you know, leaving it in droves. Um, but I, I would say too, the, um, the, my favorite piece of the whole, um, of the whole thing was that video that they showed that um, the congressman mentioned too, where Trump was trying to um, not say the words that bothered him. Um, I would say I would love to have on a T-shirt, uh, yesterday is a hard word to say. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> other than that, like the, the whole thing where he's just like the faces he's making and the, the slamming of the podium. and Like a man um, baby. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think we, we had heard stories about this, but seeing it is really different um, than I think when I pictured it just. You know, I really sort of imagined this, um, you know, this whining little man baby, and he really was just slamming his fists and making weird faces. Um, you know, uh, Sarah's, he- Sarah's so right on this point, Rick. Uh, I mean, you know, we all know uh, Trump and what he's like, et cetera. But these visuals tonight really said so much, you know, with his slamming, with his his whole demeanor, it, it was it was scary, and it was and you're standing there watching somebody that frankly is completely out of touch with reality. He's in his own world of reality. I think too. Look at the um, statement that he put out. I actually thought it was fake when I saw it. Um, where he basically just admits to everything. Um, uh, he. He the one thing that I do agree on it is like his last line. He said, "Boy, the country would be a different place if I won." It's like, well, yeah, yeah, but um, but yeah, he he says he makes it clear that he's going after, you know, he was trying to go after Mike Pence and. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, and I want to get your both thoughts on this because you know we've we've seen this frame before. Uh, of of Trump saying, well, you know, they, they care more about me than you do. You know, it, uh, he, this was pointed. I think it was uh, Jamie Herrera Butler who who said it uh, in an interview uh, that you know, hey, well, you know, they care more than than these people do. Uh, you know, the people around him and everyone saying. And I guess the amazing part of this to me, and I, I think the really surprising part for me, is how everybody around him 
as much as they are ideologically with him in this moment, they're all in unison saying, no, you got to stop this. This is bad. Mm -hmm. The only person who thinks it's a good idea is, well, the most powerful man in the world. Uh, but you know, what do you think of that frame? And let's start with you, Sarah, this idea that, well, those people who are rioting and you know taking a dump on the floor of our Capitol, they care more than, well, the Congress people who are running for their lives. Yeah, I think that that's a joke. That's really sad. Um, and I think that's the part of the hearing that was the most depressing for me, is this idea that, you know, somehow we're giving these folks a pass and um, we're seeing that in the sentencing too. I think there's the one pro-Trump judge who's giving really light sentences and, you know, it's just, it's really frustrating, I think, yeah. too, that we're not holding a lot of people accountable. And well, this I've is... seen a couple of, the, the thing that Merrick Garland said this week, right? That's the, the one piece where, you know, he seemed to get annoyed when people were pressing him on, no, seriously, like, do you care about this indictment thing? He's like, I can't say it any plainer. Nobody's above the law. So fingers crossed, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, again, this is one of those things. And let's go back to you, Bob, because, you know, you were a member of Congress. You know, one of the things that came out of this that surprised me and Sarah and I talked about this in the last segment about just how close they got to Mike Pence, how close they got to everyone. And, you know, these buildings, you know, this building, you know, how 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 really how close how close were they to snatching someone and and literally hanging the vice president? Oh, how how it didn't happen is beyond me. I mean, these watching this tonight is it's very emotional for me because not only was I a member, I chaired House administration, oversaw the Capitol Hill police, interacted with them, interacted with Democrat and Republican staff members for what they wanted, you know, to make the House work better, et cetera. And so you know these are human beings. And to listen to McCarthy, the minority leader, who calls Trump and and is begging because McCarthy knows Somebody's going to get killed, some staffer or member or both. He knows the possibility was real they were going to get killed. And they came by luck. And, and you know, the, the brave uh, Capitol Hill police and some luck, somebody wasn't hurt seriously or killed as far as we had some officers. Of course, that was horrible. But as far as a member or staff. And the most chilling moment is McCarthy, you know, begging, obviously, help us, you know, and what does Trump say to him? He basically, uh, I'll put it in my own terms, maybe these people have more guts and more smarts than you do. Mm -hmm. That's how he answers to um, the minority leader who's hunkered down thinking that he's going to be possibly killed, too. That's how Trump answers him. And you know, what's, a, what's amazing to me, Bob, and, I, and I've, I've thought about this, you know, a lot. You know, the Republicans, you know, the, the you know, the, the, you know, the, the Freedom Caucus, the Boberts, the Greens, the Gateses, the Gomerts, the, you know, the Scott Perrys, you know, all of them, you know, they should have been walking through the halls. I mean, because those are their people. They should have been completely safe. They shouldn't have been cowering in the in the chamber like like everybody else was, because, well, those are their people. They should have been out stopping them. Why weren't they? Why were they running? Uh, well, it's like Holly. You know, you can be up there with the Capitol Hill police armed, you know, behind you and the crowd down by the fence. And he, you know, he raises the fist in the air, you know, and then you I thought it was a great clip. Then you see him running and then they they play it again in slow motion, running uh, out, out the Capitol. What was he running for? Why didn't he go down to the rotunda and say, hey. How y'all doing? Yeah. I fist bumped you earlier. Remember? Yeah. Remember me? Yeah. Okay. Slow, slow your roll. Uh, exactly. Right. Sarah, your yeah, thoughts? Let's, well, let's, let's bump hands right now. <laughs> I don't think he did that. Exactly. He ran. He ran. He ran just like all of them did. And I think, too, um, the thing about members of Congress is, you know, there's 11 billion of them, whereas senators is only 100. And so um, I think a lot of those members who aren't Marjorie Taylor Greene and Boebert and, and those guys, um, they may be some of the pro-Trump members, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those rioters didn't know what they looked like. So uh, there, there are some, you know, the nutters um, that, I mean, hell, I'm not sure I could have picked out um, Gothar, you know, out of a crowd. Um, Cause the photo I have of him is old and he's got his like, you know, hair all funky in the front. And um, so I, I, some of these people, I think if they saw a member with their pen on, 
you know, they could have gone crazy on him. They could have gone full, you know, screwing him up. Well, let me um, ask you that, Bob. Like, you know, what would have stopped, you know, because she makes a great point. Most members of Congress, nobody knows. You get, correct. you know, the ones who are on Fox News, you know, the ones who occasionally get on CNN, you know, some of the leadership, but some of the lesser known people, you wouldn't be able to pick out of a lineup. What, what would have stopped them from correct. taking off the pin, throwing on a hoodie and walking out the front door? Right. I mean, <laughs> and, and if they had went uh, down there and even if some of the people, for example, knew them, uh, and and they said, well, wait a minute, I'm with you. Uh, the people might have turned on them and said, well, you didn't do enough. You didn't do it. Yeah. This was all, yeah, this was Russian roulette. I, I argue that Hawley himself, who, you know, does his great, brave uh, hand up in the air, he would have been physically injured because the crowd was so angry and so mm -hmm. violent and so vile they would have just probably said, well, what are you doing? You really didn't stop it. Let's beat him up. I mean, it, that definitely could have happened. Yeah, they wanted they wanted blood. They yeah. wanted somebody. They wanted somebody. Yeah. You listen to The Rick Smith Show. We're here with Bob Nay, former Ohio congressman and political analyst, and Sarah Burris, reporter at Raw Story. Make sure you check out her work at rawstory.com. Uh, so let me ask you the big question now to kind of move this in the, in the wrap-up stage. Uh, is this going to matter on the, on the grand scheme of things? Does this... They didn't call for indictments. They didn't call for, you know, any any criminal, uh, you know, anything. I mean, this just kind of ended with, you know, we're better than this, that kind of spiel. I'm assuming there's probably going to be another hearing down the road. Right. I also want to get your thoughts on that. But does this does this then move us to another stage? Let's start with you, Bob. Where, where do you think this goes from here? Well, I don't think it's going to go into the Department of Justice looking at this hearing tonight and saying, "Okay, we're going to we're going to go indict some somebody." You know, I don't think it's going to go into that phase. I don't think the committee's intent tonight was to say, "Here you go." Now, this one, you know, ought to be indicted or you ought to go after the, the president. But I think what was served here tonight was what our country needs. This needs to be told. It needs to be clarified. This wasn't a matter of somebody said something, hey, hi, how are you, crowd, go get them, and, and then that was it. They need, we needed to know where the highest level, which is the presidency, the president in our country, we need to know what happened, where they were at, and most importantly, we need to, to know how on the edge we really were. So I think that's what, if, if anything, that the committee serves a purpose. Now what happens after this and who looks at it and – does something on a on a justice level, you know, it's a different story. But I think they I think they really served the country's interests on a bipartisan basis with with Republicans, you know, here tonight on the uh, testifying, you know, and witnesses. I think they did the country, in my opinion, a favor to lay this out. So you know, make judgment calls, whatever you want. But here's what really happened, and this is how bad it really was within the Oval Office. It's amazing. Uh, Sarah, your thoughts? I agree. I totally agree. I think this has moved the needle in a huge way. We've already seen it in polling and obviously the focus groups we both mentioned, but um, I'm not sure tonight is, you know, the one night that matters the most, I think is the, on the whole, um, the country that has watched this, the, the things that everybody has seen that they didn't know before. Um, and I think the, some of the, probably some of the videos, some of the comments, from, um, you know, the general, uh, I think that'll probably end up on the news shows that more of the public will see who didn't watch tonight. Um, but I think it, the public is where they are already on this. I don't know that it's necessarily going to be more people think he should be indicted or more people agree this is a really important committee. Um, and then I think we look next to what the heck was the Secret Service doing? Uh, and that, that there's got to be a hearing all in and of itself right there, in my view. Seriously. Uh, but I, I wanted to get your thoughts also on the fact that Liz Cheney uh, did did address the fact that there was no cross-examination, that the Republicans deciding to, to not participate and not have cross-examination. I thought she handled that very well. I, I, th you know, I thought she did, too. And, and, of course, this was a huge mistake for the Republicans. You and I have talked about this on your show, Rick. You you always you know you always participate to you know to walk well I'm not gonna I'm not gonna participate in this because this is unfair you always participate 
McCarthy made a mistake. He should have had people there. Now, I will admit, it would have been, it would have been pretty awkward to sit there and ask, you know, Pottinger, uh, you know, and some of these other witnesses uh, questions. Uh, what, what's the question going to be? You know, are you a Donald Trump hater? <laughs> you know, are, are you a secret registered Democrat? Yeah, yeah. Jim Jordan would have done that. But, but they should have yeah. participated. I'm with you. Sarah, your, your, your thought? Yeah, they should have. This was, but I think this probably came from, from Trump's directive. I think Trump was the one who was saying, you know, if we can't have Banks and Jordan on the committee, then, you know, we're not doing it at all. Because yeah. he's into that whole, like, all or nothing thing. I, and I, don't, I think that McCarthy is smart enough to know, crap, we got to have somebody on this committee that's one of our guys. Yeah, there you um, go. But I think he listened to Trump. Yeah, it was it was a good night. I think the the hearing was a good night, guys. I appreciate you taking time for us, Bob, Sarah. Thanks, thanks so much. Always great having you on the program. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Our good friends Sarah Burris and Bob Nay. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email me, Rick, at thericksmithshow.com. Tell us what you think. What was the most important part of the hearing? Email me, Rick, at thericksmithshow.com. If you missed any portion of the program or of the hearing, make sure you grab the podcast. We'll get that out uh, and make sure that it's available. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you back here next time.